Mike, you are very much, uh, you're a Michael Kamen expert. <laughs> Is well, that I'm, I'm, I'm becoming one, it seems like. I, uh, I'm a pianist and composer myself. I'm actually trying to get my foot in the door with, with uh, film and media composing of any kind. And he's he's been a favorite of mine for a long time. And as you know, as as his scores get released, they're momentous. But I I realize there's there's a lot that left has uh, left to be seen out there and uh, heard, and there's just not as much readily available information uh, about him uh, personally and his process and you know mm -hmm. some of the people he's worked with. So. I'm really trying to get his music out there and get more information about his life out there. I, a goal of mine, if, if I was ever granted the permission, I would love to help um, publish a biography about him and uh, mm -hmm. um, get just a cat complete catalog of his musical works available to everybody out there. So. Mm -hmm. Have you, do you know, are you, do you know his family at all? I don't know the Cayman family. I have I have been in frequent contact with Pablo Urbina for the last uh, two and a half years, um, but I haven't met anybody else. What about what about like Christopher Brooks, the music editor? Do you know? I him? have I have communicated with him a few times, and uh, he's he was super helpful. I I'm not sure that he at the beginning of this process, you know, the the Robin Hood adventure was was about two years. And at first, I'm not sure if he was, he was a little hesitant about getting uh, in, more involved, I think. And I actually had to kind of convince uh, him and Pablo that there was actually more music out there left to be found. Because what happened is that initial release from 2018 was, was really close to being complete. There was probably about 16 minutes left, uh, I think. And I, I had to sort of pull out some, you know, DVD rips and, you know, some little timestamps to say, okay, yes, these are actually brand new compositions. These aren't editorially created ones. Uh, these are actual things that we haven't heard yet. And I think once, once we were able to kind of get everybody on the same page with that, he really helped out a lot. Mm, um, yeah. Cause he's like, he was so good. And then also Steve McLaughlin, do you know him? He was... I've, they have, I haven't been able to contact him myself, but he's, he's definitely on the radar. Yeah, I mean, gosh, I don't even know if I have a contact for him. But I'm going to write down. If you don't, I'm, I can try try to find it. I mean, I I haven't. It's interesting um, because my my trajectory was um, around the time that I was working very much as a very busy orchestrator in town for Michael Kamen and Basil Polidorus. I was also working for Shirley Walker. Right. And Shirley Walker was the one that 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 kind of opened the door for me as a composer. And so when my composing work got busier, I, I just couldn't keep the orchestrating for at, at one point. I just sure. you know, I just OK, I'm not going to do I'll do, orchestrate my own works when right. I can. But so I really, you know, all my big heavy hitting orchestrating gigs um, that aren't for my own projects are ended, you know, many, many years ago. So, right, of course. But, um, so what kind of, I mean, I'm trying to think, I, I can't like give you specific, like, oh yeah, the clarinet in, in 3 m <laughs> sure. I mean, I can't, I can't yeah. remember. How, but, how uh, many clarinets were in the Iran <laughs> at the time? Yeah. Um, what I'm trying to do is, um, and actually this is momentous and uh, really coincidental, it turns, I found out just yesterday that um, a special edition uh, 4K Blu-ray of this movie is coming out in May and it's gonna get a top to bottom restoration and there's gonna be all sorts of special features and interviews and things. And I thought, wow, that this would be the thing that I'm fixating on. And it looks like some, you know, people on the film side specifically are trying to get things moving. You're talking so about last action hero, right? Yes, yeah. ma'am. Uh -huh. So what I'm trying to do is generate um, some interest uh, with uh, with the fans, of course, the film music fans, fans of the movie, and of course the record labels like Entrada and La La Land to um, choose this as their next uh, Cayman project. I think um, I think it's a perfect cross section of what he did best. You know, his bombastic big symphony uh -huh. uh, fused with hard rock. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it's, it's like the best of all of his worlds, you know, in this one score. So I'm, I'm, what I wanted to talk to you about is just to see if there was any, anything memorable, memorable about it that stuck out to you. What, what your involvement in the process was, if you composed or if you just orchestrated anything to sort of shed, um, shine a light on this particular score. Well, just, I mean, 
all of the work that I did for Michael, it was the era pre, there was no logic or digital performer or anything like that. So he had a keyboard that generated a piano and plus string sound. Right. That he would um, have a cassette recorder and he would have his picture up and he would, you know, play, improvise to picture. Okay. Now, now he um, he is a was a very skilled orchestrator. It wasn't that he wasn't un, uh, he wasn't sure. didn't have the education. He he could do it all. But um, the the work process was that I started out for him, and this is you know applies to Robin Hood. And I actually don't even remember which order the films came in, but I know that on Last Action Hero I did actually orchestration. Um, he would improvise, and then he would have. <laughs> Myself and then I, I hired a couple more people to actually do transcriptions of a cassette, okay. cassette recording. So I'd sit and listen, you know, whatever, write write a little two two line sketch of what he's playing. You wow. know, sometimes you'd have to kind of assume that he just kind of made some mistakes and kind of clean it up. And so yes. then that sketch, then I would go back to his place. So he had a place up in Encino that he would rent right. called Chapel. Um, I don't know if you know that. Way. No, I did not. No. Yeah, Chapel was, uh, it used to be uh, owned by, um, I think, was it Annie Lennox and Dave Stewart? Anyways, it'd be a big, big kind of mansion place with what, house, pool, and then a studio. Wow. And uh, the thing is, you'd, you know, you'd drive up, you'd go in, and you'd wait to meet with Michael, and then he would, he would, he or Chris Brooks or somebody would give you the cassette to take back and then I would I would transcribe it then I'd go back there with my whatever sketch pad wow. and he would look at it and he'd say you know he'd just write in his handwriting strings strings plus woodwinds uh you know and then he'd circle and then he'd sometimes write write in some things like add add low brass chords and, and he'd sure. start he'd start a few you know he'd start like add them you know playing on the on the downbeats or something pads or something and as a as a pre-orchestration phase then i would you know fill in those chords and then from there it would then it would go to either i would take it home or orchestrate it or it would be um i'm just i'm actually looking at the list i know that um bill ross did a bunch on that bill ross did a bunch jonathan Sachs, yeah for sure bill ross is a do you know bill ross i've uh, connected with him uh, via email actually yes yeah he he's a great um he's a great great uh composer and orchestrator and uh i have a vivid memory of uh of uh, one of these movies it, it was probably this it could have been one of the lethal weapons though where we were he has a, he's having a conversation with michael and it's like michael says bill take the ball and run with it and bill's like well the, the ball's kind of heavy and that was kind of like the <laughs> code word for you know just you know, do the next, take it to the next level. Now right. it's not composition, but it's, 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 it is, there is definitely, it's so common now. I mean, right. back then it was um, to have that level of the magnitude of project and to, and people just kind of assume that the one composer was doing it. Right. And so all these people would be the support staff just to get it done. And it wasn't Michael's fault that they were recutting the picture on the day exactly. of the, where the session was the next day. So he was so gracious with his with his compliments, the way that people got paid. Um, he was one of the best human beings that I've ever met in the business. He was really a, a wonderful, wonderful human being. And so uh, the fact that he was actually created so much work for orchestrators and people that uh, like myself before orchestrating that would take these take his improvisations and you know if it's tonal music and you're here if, if if i played you the cassette i wish i had you know who would have thought you know right. at those days you know i was just i i feel like i was just in a kid i just a kid you know i was just just barely 30 um it was you know i was i had babies i was having babies and as like, i was like this whole time where I'm, yeah. I'm a young mom and i have all this work and I didn't think, oh, someday I should save this cassette because, right. uh, you know, because that would be fascinating to hear his improvisations. And Absolutely. Then, but I don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't know where they would even be. But this is something that Chris Brooks might might have. And this would be something maybe that maybe the family has and they'd be ready to, to release some of that. But I, um, yeah. Yeah. So his thing was always um, he very much wanted to, he, for him the idea of the minutia of 
taking writing spending all that time scribbling it all out mm -hmm. um then what i would do also is then once once we kind of reviewed the sketch then he would say lay it out on the score so sometimes i would take the sketch and put it in the middle of the score and it would be neatly written so you could see what whatever the melody is is in the right hand and some accompaniment or sometimes it'd be three lines whatever he had composed sure. in, you know via playing and then he could actually start the orchestration he could say uh, start the flute line and then you know like just copy a little bit and then put etc and then somebody would take it and go home and, and finish it you know so oh. it was all hand copied you know those, when, those times were really insane up there because they he would be he always worked on these not always but most of those projects were these massive big budget projects huge orchestras huge budgets and constant changing of the editing and it's not like now where things can just be digital it's like he would there were times where we would go to the scoring stage and some the producers say, oh, we recut re that completely. And it's like, you know, you're, you're talking thousands of dollars in orchestration right. and copying. And it's like everything would have to be done over again. And he he was never he never got angry about any of that. He just kind of rolled with the punches. And right. Yeah. Well, I was I was struck by um, well, and actually, let me circle back for a second. You know, this was, of course, before Logic and even, um, you know, Sibelius and those other um, programs for scoring, were you and the other orchestrators handwriting the actual orchestral scores? At the everything was school? handwritten. Yeah, everything was handwritten. I thought so, but that still kind of blows my mind, particularly with something like Robin Hood, how complex it was, how much was constantly changing, it seems like. I'm, I've gotten a picture of this, this production that, you know, it seems like even while his orchestra was recording a piece of music, they were simultaneously handing him some new change that would require either a massive edit or a total rewrite of something. Right, right. Uh, and and in, in the liner notes in there, it indicated that you guys I think I've got this correct. You guys were still handwriting the finishing touches on the main theme to the film the night before you had to record. Or Robin Hood? Robin Hood? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I actually have the, the front first page of the score because uh, he orchestrated and, or, and I orchestrated because it was one of these where he had written it. Uh -huh. And uh, he had composed it and it and but not physically written it. And then you know, I put the sketch, like I said, the sketch in the middle, and then he started, and it was just like he needed to get some sleep. So I just continued sure. in his style, and basically, it was it was very much like, you know, the copyists are like pulling the pages, you know, four bars at a time right, away right. just to get it ready. And that that piece is so iconic. And yeah, I actually have that front that first page framed on my wall because. Um, he he wrote yeah he wrote for lowly to thank you for every minute every every minute of your precious time and talent you were a godsend love michael and uh and i was actually you know i was actually pregnant with my with my first child and so in an era where where women working in the business that's another thing like he was not at all a sexist he was such a he empowered women to i mean he never said oh I, i'm not going to give you work because you're pregnant or something like that so on on a whole nother level um he was just extraordinary and one person that would be really interesting for you to talk to if you haven't already would be doreen ringer ross Do you, i've i've she's no longer she's no longer at bmi but she just absolutely adored michael and um she is I'm, I'm, i think she's probably still on the board of mr holland's opus um, oh i didn't know she was on a, a part of the foundation that's good to know it might be but yeah so yeah and that whole thing started after that film you know because he, he he you know i worked a little bit on that film but but um I, I know that on last action hero he had kind of a mix of up and coming orchestrators and like people that could actually stay up all night for several nights in a row and sure be okay and then he also had um jack hayes who's, you know, brilliant, brilliant orchestrator, older, older gentleman, gentleman at the time, he's long since passed, but that's, you know, he would love, he loved to pay homage to like the, the brilliant orchestrators of a previous era by right. bringing them on to a, for a few projects. Chris, oh. Board, Chris Boardman, who is actually, how far is Nashville from, from where you are? About four, about four hours, I'd say. Chris Boardman is living in Nashville now, and he is, uh, I mean, he would be fascinating for you to meet with because he's right. I'd, I'd, he actually I'd, might have stuff i mean he's like one of these people that kept everything i think 
And uh, I know that you Warner, like the Warner Brothers stuff, um, I think a lot of that is down at USC. Okay. Oh, I think that's correct. Yeah. Um, I, and forgive me, I keep I keep jumping between the two movies without very clear okay. segues. Um, I've I've definitely connected with uh, Chris because I, I have to tell you when I was when I was going through, this, this was such a great um, a, a revelatory experience for me realizing just how many people were working on the Robin Hood score in particular to help uh, help finish it. Um, I, I had this spreadsheet. I, I basically made this list of every single person that was on there. And I, you know, I'm reaching out to people via email and I'm trying to do it in a way that I'm not constantly bot, you know, contacting the same people. Sure. But I was able, like, I was just humbled and blown away by how kind and gracious everyone was. They, not everybody had material necessarily, necessarily, but they would point me in the right direction and say, okay, this is what I did call uh, call Chris um, Brooks, call Pablo, reach out to these people. And it really, it really, I think in the end, I think it was just a matter of getting the right people kind of reconnected with each other. But it was fascinating because this, this community of people still had this very rich connection with each other, even though some of them, some of them I think have kept in contact and some of them hadn't talked uh -huh. to each other, you know, since this movie. Right. And it was really fascinating. Um, I could imagine that during while there's still a pandemic and people are still in these Zoom things, I, I bet you could probably get some sort of a group chat happening, which might be interesting for you. I could imagine that, you know, if you wanted to try to pull that off, you know, get Bill Ross and get Chris Brooks and kind now of be, might be the time to try. <laughs> Fly, fly on the wall uh you you know an interview or kind of like but it's 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 the idea of like what so it's it's for a book so you're collecting collecting information yeah so yeah it's i just you know it's one of those things I, like now i'm such a I'm, I'm such a photo nut i have so many photos but from that era that was pre iphone pre you know you right. didn't take a camera to you know I, i'm not going to take a camera in my late 20s to you know, right. a place where, you know, Eric Clapton might be playing guitar for Lethal Weapon and say, oh, can we do a self, you know, there's like, there were no self, right. so, you know, but I do, I do have, a, I have one picture of me and him that I, that I could send you if you have. Oh, I would love, it. love to see yeah. it. That would be great. Yeah. I look mortified. I look like, I like, like I'm standing next to him by on the podium, you know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, and I also know um, the copyist, Joel Franklin. Do you know Joel? No, I haven't connected with him. Um, yeah, I don't know if he worked on Last Action Hero, but I certainly could reach out to him and see where all his he had tons of photos because oh. he he was a he did the he put the, got got the parts on the stands. So, you know, he was also he used to be a a, a photographer, but then he went into music preparation, and okay. so he would occasionally get the green light to take photos. Oh, his, that's that's so important, you know, and again, it's, a, it's not something that anybody would be thinking about at the time, especially when the pressure was on to get something completed. But, you know, when we do get a little video or a photographic glimpse into these processes, I just, I just find it so fascinating. Yeah. I was, um, with regard to the, the Last Action Hero music, there's, there's actually two uh, soundtracks available. There's, of course, the total rock band, uh, O o OST presentation, which uh -huh. is, you know, Def Leppard, Leopard, uh, right. ACDC, all those people. Uh -huh. And of course, the actual bits of score that are available on that separate CD. Uh -huh. And I was wondering if you remembered, if you had any insight into which of those bands, if any of them actually performed in the sessions for the music in the movie, um, in addition to recording their pop song. I that don't have a memory of them being part of the score. Okay. I do not have a memory of that. If anything, it would have been some sort of a, some rhythm tracks that would have been laid down at chapel. It wouldn't have been done like at, at the big recording stage. It would have been done like more in Michael's environment, which was chapel, which is the house and the studio in Encino where he would, you know, he lived in London and, and in New York, but then he had this place here that we, he would rent. Right. Basically. And that's, and they would do sometimes pre records. I know they did stuff there for lethal weapon three and four. Mm -hmm. um, so if you ever get to those films, um, there's another, there's another couple people that would be good to talk to, but it's really more like, I think if you had a, a guideline of, of all your questions, you know, 
Sure. And it's it, it could almost be like putting the puzzle pieces together. Like send send the same questions to everybody. Who does does anyone have the answers to these following questions? Because it's like you know, if so, if I see what somebody else says, that might it might spark a sure. spark a memory of something. And in fairness to you and everybody, it has been twenty eight years. So you know, it's 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 been a hot yeah. it's been a hot minute. It's, it's crazy. Although some of that stuff, some of the moments are so vivid in my memory. Um, but Last Action Hero was kind of, it seemed just like super busy and it was like a lot of other stuff was going on. I'm just saying it was, what year was it? It was 93. 93 and Robin Hood was before that. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's like, it's just, it's like trying to think of what else was going on then? I mean, it's it, right. interesting because that was a very, very busy time. Mm -hmm very busy time in town where there were still so many sessions happening. Sure. I'm just looking on my own orchestration credit list. Um, music department. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, I got to scroll down. So yeah. So last action hero, last action hero, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it was a bit, very busy time. What's the meteor man. I don't even know what that is. Oh, that's a, that's a sort of, kind of fallen into obscurity, a superhero movie with uh, oh. Robert Townsend. Okay, yeah, I don't know why I have credit on that, but whatever, anyway. So yeah, it was Lethal Weapon 3 and then Last Action Hero, but Lethal Weapon 4, yeah, it was a busy time. I was already working on Batman the Animated Series, so right. yeah, it was that, that, that year, those years were really crazy, really crazy busy, but but yeah, I wish I had more details. I think finding the scores, locating the physical scores would be an amazing thing. Um, Absolutely. And I, I think yeah. what I'm what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm waiting for word. There's a new um, curator, I suppose would be the title of the Cayman collection at the estate, because I think Pablo stepped down from that position. And their goal was to get their hands on all physical musical elements, score, um uh, recording tapes and uh, tracks and whatnot so i'm waiting to hear back from uh the new project manager there to see if they do have the score because i think i mm -hmm. think you're right that would be really helpful um but that that's perfectly fine i mean what you, what you shared here is a is a terrific insight right. into that relationship and of course just on mr cayman uh, personally it does not surprise me at all to hear that he was so welcoming and, and he so, was so kind. I mean, he sent a baby gift when my son was born. And I mean, it's like, it's just, he was just a really, really good human being. And, um, you know, I remember when he, when he died, you know, he got, he had uh, MS. Um, mm -hmm. And when he died, it was like his memorial was just like, was the who's who of the best musicians in town. Um, right. Everyone was speaking at this beautiful event on the Fox lot at, in the big, big um, auditorium. So listen, I'm happy to talk again with you, speak again with you sometime. Maybe I I now, now knowing what you're looking for, I can I can pick my brain. But I'm actually I have to leave for another appointment. That is it, was, it was a fine. pleasure, oh, pleasure to. Likewise, have thank you. you so so much for this. Oh, it's been a dream. You're very welcome, and please keep you know keep me posted on how it's going, and if and I I will send you that photo if I can find it, and and maybe send you some other contact information for other people. Thank you so much. We'll talk again soon. Okay, stay well. You Bye. too. Bye. Bye.